All right, uh, welcome everyone to the February regular meeting of the Maritime Advisory Board. Uh, for those of you who are viewing from elsewhere, uh, I'm Terry Lomax, I'm the chair. Uh, the members present are Andrew Fagley, Peter Trogdon, Rick Frankie, Frida Wildy, Scott Allen, Bill Woodward, uh, Debbie Goslin, and Duncan Hood. We also have our uh, assistant city attorney, Ashley Leonard. Uh, we have uh, Stephen, you all, you, the squares keep jumping around, <laughs> Stephen Rice. Uh, and we have Jackie Guild, our deputy city manager. And we have Barbara Beeler, who's a guest this evening. And, uh, and Ryan is our host uh, and technical guru. So with that, um, I will uh, we'll get started. Uh, as is typical uh, for our meetings, at least, um, I tend to take our guests first so they do not have to suffer through the minutia of everything else. Uh, so we'll start, uh, Jackie, with you and uh, Hawkins Cove, if you want to go first. Got to unmute. Yeah, too go. many Zoom meetings. <laughs> um, uh, okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so... Terry sat was sitting in on one of the community listening sessions for Hawkins Cove and asked if I would um, come before this board to brief you on what's going on there and allow you to ask any questions you may have or raise concerns. Um, the city, and I'm not sure if everyone knows where Hawkins Cove is, so um, we had a presentation which was not in my possession, so I couldn't bring it up on the screen. Um, but for those of you who don't know where it is, um, Hawkins Cove is located in Eastport, right behind the Hacka headquarters building. It's a tributary off of Spa Creek. If you're facing the water from the shore, the Shearwater condominiums are up the hill to your right, and the Spa Cove apartments are to your left. And for those of you who have been down there, um, if you cross a small footbridge um, on the Spa Cove apartment side, that leads you to Primrose, um, through the woods to Primrose, and then connects onto the trails at Truxton Park. And a lot of people walk and run through there, walk their dogs through there from the Eastport side to the Truxton Park side and vice versa. So that's how a lot of people know Mahawkins Cove. Um, the situation with the con current conditions at Hawkins Cove is that it's it's not very, a very appealing place right now. Um, there's heavy sedimentation. There's about 10 feet of sediment actually. It's legacy sediment um, because the Spot Creek Conservancy in 2017 did a a restoration project uphill of the cove, which is largely taking care of a lot of the pollutants and other sediment that is coming downhill and hits the cove now. They did a regenerative stream conveyance system project, which slows down, and allows the storm water to filter in and soak in and filter out of a lot of pollutants before it hits the cove. Um, so the existing pier at the cove has is in need of some repair. There's some boards missing. That's not entirely safe right now. And also, there's no way you're bringing any kind of boat up to use the pier or, or the, uh, the mooring poles there because of the sediment. Um, it was usable at one time, and that's why the pier is there and there are rings to tie up to. Um, there's also no natural vegetation in the cove at this time. The sediment has taken care of that. It's smothered everything. There's some invasive phragmites there. That's about it. And on shore, um, it's a, a lot of invasive plants, thorns, underbrush, and English ivy that has crept up the trees. There's it, Some of them are just holding the trees up and others, some other places the ivy is killing the trees. So a lot of invasives on the shore and the area is not very appealing to use on the land side nor on the water side at present. So the city has made it a priority to restore Hawkins Cove to um, provide some ecological uplift, to restore the natural vegetation and improve water quality there. But in doing so, we are performing upfront uh, community listening sessions. And we've convened stakeholder groups, property managers of the nearby um, community, from nearby condos and apartments and other communities. Um, we have um, HACA involved and, the, and leadership and people who are uh, community leaders at Eastport Terrace and Harbor House. And we um, made one presentation at a Ward 8 Town Hall a couple of weeks ago. We had a stakeholder engagement uh, meeting and we had one community listening session last week and we have another one tomorrow night at seven o'clock. Um, there are signs outside of Hawkins Cove and at Hawkins Cove which have a scannable 
sign up for the meeting. You can also um, contact our community ombudsman, Hillary Raftkovich, or contact me, and we will get you signed up to participate in the meeting tomorrow night um, to ask questions and give ideas for Hawkins Cove. We're, we're very, we will present some of the um, findings that we've already gathered from the community listening sessions we've had. We've put out some surveys. Um, mayor, the mayor's staff has been out and about in the neighborhoods passing out flyers. And when we run into community uh, residents, we talk to them about Hawkins Cove, ask questions about what they would, how they would like to see um, the Cove improved, how they would like to use the Cove. And um, there's been no decisions made about anything about how we're doing the ecological restoration or what kind of community amenities we might put at Hawkins Cove. Right now, we're just gathering information. We're going to um, distill it down to um, the majority consensus on uses there. And not all of those uses, of course, will be feasible, nor will they, all of them be allowed by law. MDE has certain regulations, the Army Corps of Engineers and Critical Area Commission all have certain requirements and parameters and restrictions. So some of the ideas will not be able to pass muster with the regulatory agencies. So we will see what the consensus is and what we could achieve there. Um, I'm applying for grant funding through um, the Chesapeake Bay Trust in early March. Whether or not we receive funding from the trust, we'll seek funds in a different direction, but the idea is to um, restore the cove, make it usable, and make it a community resource for everybody with community input. Different ideas that have been floated are leave it as natural as possible, restore, get rid of the bulkhead, which is starting to fail, and put in a living shoreline, plant some native, get rid of the non-natives and invasives, on the um, landward side, replant with natives, native trees, native vegetation, clear out the underbrush and some of the trash there, put in some picnic tables, and a few benches, improve the trails, um, make them uh, more accessible to seniors and safer for everybody, particularly seniors. There's some very steep areas, very muddy areas. Um, another idea was to um, continue the little bridge that has been put in over the creek and um, put in a sort of a boardwalk that goes through the wettest part, which are wetlands, so that it's safer. Um, the wetlands are not destroyed, they're protected, and it's not as wet. Um, improve the pier, we've heard that again and again. Um, we've been asked about dredging, the possibility of dredging out the sediment there, whether any of that sediment would be taken care of with a living shoreline um, improvement over the bulkhead, um, bringing in a water taxi, Let's see what else. Mostly, I mean, a lot of people don't want to see a lot of recreational there. They would like to see it like passive use, a place where you could have lunch at a picnic table or read a book on a bench. Currently, there's nothing down there such as a bench or a picnic table. So different, these are the kinds of ideas that have been floated so far. So um, with that, I'll just leave it open to questions from you. So for the board's benefit, um, some of us know uh, these kinds of areas by the, from the water. If you were to come up to Truxton boat ramp and go past Truxton boat ramp, leaving it on your starboard hand, you, right. would, go in, you would go into Hawkins Cove. And if you drew two feet of water, you'd get about two thirds of the way up there before you were churning up mud. Right. Uh, or set, sediment. It is uh, very silted in at the upper end um, and, and basically not navigable. I don't think you could get up to that pier Except, mm -hmm, no. except maybe with a kayak. And I'm not sure you'd want to go up there right now with an SUP uh, stand up paddleboard, uh, because if you fell off, you'd probably be ankle deep in mud. Mm -hmm. uh, but, um, but that's geographically where it is. It uh, is also accessible from the street uh, coming down past the Hacka uh, offices in Eastport. Um, so that gives everybody an idea of where it is. And I had asked Jackie just to come fill us in, since it is an it is a water cove and it is a. I hesitate to use the word a street in park at the moment because it's neither real street in nor is it a park, but uh, it is a piece of accessible property to the water, uh, uh, city property that, that can't, you can't access down to the water from. Um, we have Barbara Beeler, who I think Barbara, you're a. You're a neighbor on the cove, is that correct? Uh, yeah, I live um, in Shearwater, and at about the point you start running out of water 
if you're heading up Hawkins Cove and anything with draft <laughs> um, and actually have seen boats e even churning up the mud where I am sort of across yeah. from the, uh, the boat ramp. Um, I, I did want to share uh, with you guys that um, Jackie and, and staff are doing, uh, it, it, she's under a very tight time frame. Um, but I think sh the, the group that talked last week, we're, we're coming to sort of a consensus position I th for the most part, at least within the, the sort of working group that um, the passive use, use, what are the assets there? Um, and they are limited. This isn't a wide open space. It's not an opportunity for swimming, fishing, you know, boating at this point. And, um, uh, but there are a lot of things that can be developed and put in there to make it a place to draw people and, and to draw people across the various communities uh, in Eastport. And I think that that's um, a real, uh, the important theme that's been underlying the conversation. So it's sort of environmental and equity and um, kinds of issues that I think Jackie and her team have done a very well job in, in shepherding forward. Um, I, I, there is the issue of managing expectations. You can only do so much there. And, yeah. and I think that that's when you've got a neat idea, it's, you know, it's, it's trying to guide that managing of expectations of what's real and what we'd like, you know, I'd love to have a place where people go swimming and appear for fishing and um, more access to our waterways, but um, I'm not sure that this is a place and I'm not sure that the dredging could be really justified for the small waterway. Uh, and it would be outrageously expensive, and you would have to be maintaining the uh, the dredge o over time. So, but thank you for letting me share. Uh, we're I think everybody who's been involved in it's, but is excited, and I think it is a an evolving and positive uh, project. And, and, and that's, that's a good point. Um, you know, and the. Even if we get initial money to do the ecological uplift and do some improvements on shore, that's not to say that's where we would end. We, yeah. This might be a phased process where there might be a beginning project. We might need to seek additional funding to do more work there. I mean, kind of, um, one person who was on the call last time, I liked how they kind of broke things down into four different segments of Hawkins Cove. And I added a fifth. And because you have the shoreline where the bulkhead is right now, um, you have the water uses you have the shore side right next to the bulkhead you have the trails and then i added on and then there's the section where you have that very wide steep driveway that comes down from Hacka down to the water and there's a pump station located there as well that's obviously a big source of stormwater pollution coming down it's sort of gravel sort of hard packed um, and it empties out into a couple of small rain gardens that the um, Spot Creek Conservancy also put in. But there's a little channel that comes off of that that they did not have funding to improve that leads down to the cove. So you could look at it in five different segments, too, and we could pick which portions we're going to address first. Um, and as Barbara's pointed out, she's been a really great participant with great ideas. Um, we may want to do just keep as much of it as passive use as possible and do the shoreline improvements and a little bit on the shore and work on the trails and leave it at that. Um, and if there's um, a lot of um, support for other projects as well, we may have to do that in a phased approach. So uh, Jackie, where does this trail connect? I, I, you indicated that it goes from, it goes across uh, a little bridge. It sounds like it goes through Spock Cove Apartments over to Primrose Road or those you, you, you Yeah. Yeah. If you're coming down the hill, if you're on the east port, the Hacka side, and you're coming down that driveway, off to your left, there is a trail that everyone uses to cut through the woods. And then they slightly go downhill, and the small tributary that ends up in Hawkins Cove, where Spock Creek did some improvements, 
Um, there's a little footbridge that's been put in there recently over the rocks. That There's trails that continue on beyond that. You can see Spob Cove Apartments to your left, but they wind along through there. Um, there's kind of an informal trail that ends up um, further up Primrose near a dumpster. That's that's kind of an informal trail, but there's another one that continues on and empties out on Primrose um, Street. And from there, people continue across Primrose through the parking lot where the skate park is. If any of you are familiar with the skate park, it's right up um, the street from the boat launch. And then they continue on there to the um, trails at Truxton Park. So those are the trails I was referring to. So there, if you were to come down, if you were coming down the uh, driveway at Hacka, there, was, there would be nothing in terms of a trail or anything off to the right. No, that's that takes you to Shearwater. Okay, okay. Um, then I'll go around and at, see if anyone on the board has any questions. Um, just for the board's information, I see Duncan. Hang on, one second, and I'll and Jackie wasn't uh, my intent that we try to. Uh, Add to add to the input necessarily that you all had. It's really more of an informational thing for us for the board, since we deal with the street in parks uh, from time to time, to uh, get this on our radar at least as another access point. Um, Duncan, you had a question. Yeah. Hi. Hey, Jackie. Uh, Barbara had said that you are under a, a pretty tight time frame. What is that time frame? Um, so we, we're applying for funding through the Chesapeake Bay Trust through the Green Streets, Green Cities program. And the deadline is March 4th or March 5th. I'm going to give myself one last day here. I think it's March 4th um, to get the grant in for that. Woo, that is tight. Well, I certainly yeah. agree. I'm, I'm very familiar with that area. And it's pretty bad. So I, I'm totally behind this. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. So in the community outreach will extend beyond, you know, this is just the initial community outreach to get an idea for a conceptual plan for grant purposes. If the grant is awarded and we would find that out around the end of March, um, then we would go on to design. And as part of that, we would pre be presenting a concept plan to the community for further input. So there'll be further opportunities for um, community input. Thank you very much. That's great. You're welcome. Uh, is there anybody else have any questions or comments for Jackie? Yes, um, uh, Jackie. Scott. Yeah, Scott Allen here. Um, with the Chesapeake um, Bay Trust, have you taken any of the staff down for a walk through there to show them what they're you're talking about? From the trust, yes. Good. Yeah, Jan has been down there. Jana Davis has been down there a couple of times with us, um, with the mayor and Department of Public Works. You know, of course, we have to make sure that we're not running into any pipes or anything like that when we do projects and again that could be a constraint where things are located under the ground that we're not aware of and we could have great ideas but then we have to work around our infrastructure and, in, and as far as water access that's another idea is many people would like to be able to put in a canoe a paddle board a kayak but you really can't do that right now there's too much sediment um and it's pretty mucky i don't know if anyone's tried to walk in there but it it, it you could get really stuck in the, the mud there quicksand yeah yeah pretty much and what about as far as nature trails and, and with signage and yes thank you um, yes so you know the the trails um could be improved further um if you know it depends on how much we want to get into getting into the woods and removing invasives there um but the trails we the city has improved them somewhat made them a little bit less of social trails and a little wider, but I do think that there are places where they're kind of steep and muddy and slick that we could be putting uh, like boardwalk type of steps in. Um, we could put like a boardwalk, as I said, through some of the wetland areas, maybe some more sawdust or wood chips down to absorb some of the moisture in the area and um, signage. So we definitely would want to put, if we do a living shoreline there or some sort of vegetated um, shoreline and take out the bulkhead, um, we would definitely want to put signage in that describes what is there and why, especially as it grows in. The first year, it's not going to look particularly um, well vegetated, but they, those types of shorelines and projects grow in pretty quickly if you're familiar with them. And you see um, aquatic species and other species return pretty quickly to the area. They start to recover and bounce back. And when they do that, they start to filter pollutants. And you're going to see water um, quality improvements within a year definitely within a year. 
Um, and then we would also, uh, the Spot Creek Conservancy, when they put in the regenerative um, stream conveyance system, they did not include signage with that um, project either. So a lot of people are going through there without even realizing what's been done there. So um, I've been in contact with Spot Creek Conservancy to partner with them on signage and other input. And then um, we are finding out more and more about some of the history of the area and that this was used actually was a productive um, area for watermen at one time. So we may you know, look into other type of signage about historical um, issues as well. And we would, um, this could definitely be used as an educational kind of um, endpoint for children to visit, um, on, to visit the trails and the shoreline as an environmental science type of outing. If it's city property, um, can you access city funding to help with some of the in infrastructure? We may be able to, yes. We're gonna go for grant funding first and see how far that goes with what we envision there. Um, there may be other grant opportunities I may seek, but also we do have money from the Watershed Restoration Fund to make improvements like this. So that would be another source. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, does anybody else have any questions, comments uh, for Jackie before I let her go celebrate uh, Mardi Gras? <laughs> I'm um, actually Jackie, in the middle of another climate change a, meeting. Go ahead. Jackie, um, how much are you asking for in your grant? What's the amount? It's a very good question. I have not come up with a total amount yet. I'm still talking to the trust about the amount we should seek. And um, they're thinking, they're, their initial thought was something around the um, lines of $60,000. But that was mostly for the improvements we were thinking about along the shore. However, they think that we could do design and some of the implementation for about $60,000. Um, the trail work, I think, is going to require a, a bit more money, and that may come from another funding source. Anybody else? Are there any other sources of, are there any other sources of money besides the, the grant? Then is the city have any money? And where else can you find some funds? As I mentioned um, just a minute ago, the Watershed Restoration Fund, which is some people call it the rain tax, um, that money is there for us to use for just such projects, for um, restoration projects like this. So we, we've already tapped that initially for a lot of work in the Back Creek Watershed and the Spot Creek Watershed, but we can add on other projects. Uh, and then we can also seek other grant funding. But there's quite a pool of money there. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Uh, um, Jackie, uh, no. Bill Woodward here. Um, I've been listening to you. Uh, this is the first opportunity that I've had to, uh, to, to, to hear you. And I would say that this project has a very good person uh, leading the charge. I've been very impressed with you know, how you've presented things. And um, I see that you're the city deputy manager. I'm not as familiar as some of the other board members with uh, some of the people that work in, in the city department, but um, I, I just want to compliment you on your presentation. I didn't see you referring to notes or anything like that. So I can tell that this is very near and dear to your heart. Yes. And, and so I wish you success. And I think you'll have the uh, backing of the board uh, from what I'm gathering this evening. All right. Thank you, I really appreciate that. So I'm working with um, also making sure that we're, we're trying to get as many, much of the community that lives around there engaged. And some of that's sometimes difficult, especially during COVID, we're doing everything virtually. So I'm hoping that, you know, as some of the people get more and more vaccinated, we may be able to do, when we have a concept design, actually get a gathering of people socially distanced, actually down at the cove. So we could have a conceptual design, you know, large scale printed out and up on a sign to give people an idea of you know, what, what, could, what it could look like as they stand down there at the cove. And maybe as the weather gets better, more people will be willing to come out to do that. But we've, um, we have our African-American liaison and our Hispanic liaison working with um, community members. We translated all our materials into Spanish as well. To, to, if people aren't coming out and engaging in the listening sessions, at least they have the information and we're hoping that they respond to the surveys and we get some information from them that way. 
I've been out there quite a bit walking the trails and I run into kids and I run into ladies walking and, and people running and I stop them and I tell them what our ideas are and ask them, you know, how would you like to see this area improve? And sometimes just by stopping people like that, you know, and I know other people in the mayor's office are helping me with that as well. You know, we get a lot of good ideas. We get a lot of good feedback from people who will not, you know, come to a Zoom meeting or come to a meeting in general. So Jackie, would it, would it, and I don't know what what the particular grant process is for the Chesapeake Bay Trust, uh, but would it be helpful if there is a resolution from this board supporting uh, the project? And if so, um, we could certainly, I suspect, do that. I don't know whether that's something that would be helpful or not. It would be helpful. And, and you know, a letter um, of support from this board would be helpful. All right. Um, hearing, unless there is an objection, I'll put together a letter Jackie, if you just send me information on where to, who to address it to, et cetera, yes. um, and I'll circulate it around to the board, a draft around for everybody to, to comment on, but uh, we will get that, get that in. Okay, I really appreciate that, thank you. All right, does anybody have anything else? All right, well with that, uh, Jackie, thank you very much. Barbara, thank you very much for your input. Uh, and um, we will conclude the discussion of Hop Hawkins Cove and move on to our regular agenda. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Good night. Um, Look. We'll start with the uh, approval of the minutes from January, not December. Uh, I will uh, tweak the agenda for that. But um, is there a motion to approve the uh, minutes from the January meeting? So moved. Is there a, thank you, Debbie. Is there a second? I second. second. All right, Mr. Frankie seconded. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Minutes are approved. Um, <clears throat> turning to the uh, Rick, Frankie, the any update from the M A I B M I A B. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you, Terry. And for a change, I have something to report this time. <laughs> um, the re the uh, economic study has been completed, all the final drafts were approved, and it's back in the hands of the, uh, uh, of the board, and I'm sure will be released within the next couple of days. But um, I did get permission to share it with you. It is a 28 page document, so I did not send it to you. Um, and I'll talk to Terry probably. Terry, I'll try to give you a call tomorrow. I okay. think I figured out how to get it to you so you can distribute it to all of us. Okay. Um, or if there's I, a link, if there's a link, uh, just give me the yeah. link, you know, a, 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 a website link. Right. So, but what I would like to do since this thing is, has gone on for so long, uh, there it has generated some interesting numbers and I'd like to share just uh, uh, a little bit basically the last paragraph really of the executive summary of this 28 page document. And you need to remember that this um, the bulk of the data that went into this is 2018 data. And the, um, the data gathering and a lot of the study was completed just before the COVID shutdown started. So it, although there is reference to it in a couple of places in the report, there's no attempt to reflect what COVID has done to and for the recreational boating industry, which as we all know has been enormous. Um, okay, uh, now I'll quote, I'm just gonna read directly from the uh, report. When properly defined, the maritime industry directly supports 5,700 jobs and more than $274 million in employee compensation per annum in Anne Arundel County. Once multiplier effects are considered, Anne Arundel County's maritime industry supports an estimated 8,600 jobs, $416 million in annual employee compensation, and nearly $1.2 billion in annual economic activity. And a couple of other numbers that are in here, not in this, this paragraph, but are in the, the summary uh, that's uh, included here, is 16 million in county tax revenues generated by our industry, 
Um, 96 million estimated in annual, in annual expenditures by recreational voters. And this number, which I really found very interesting, uh, is based on studies going back to 1980, there has been a 581% increase in the number of boat slips in the county since 1980. So it's got some interesting things in it. And I think uh, you'll find some of it uh, kind of interesting. Uh, the, they, the report runs down all of the things they did to generate all of these numbers. And then it comes up with five very specific recommendations. And um, I, I could give you those, but I'd rather you see them in the context of the full report. So any questions? All right, Rick. Uh, and what I'll do is once I get the information from Rick, either in terms of an attachment or a uh, link, I will forward that around to everyone <clears throat> and you can then read it at your leisure. Um, it's, uh, those are some uh, big numbers. I, I, don't, I, don't, I suspect they did not break out where those numbers come from in terms of city versus other areas of the county. They're just overall county numbers. These are overall county numbers, which I am assuming include the city because there was never any instruction to break that out. Okay. Uh, to the group. Okay. All right. Any questions on that? Um, Rick, uh, just a quick question. I might have missed it. Is there a census on the number of actual slips, i.e., the number of boats? Um, uh, yeah, the there county? is. Um, that's something which occasions a, a, quite a bit of the discussion uh, in prior to approval. Uh, the paragraph before the one I read to you begins with the following uh, sentence. With more than 500 miles of coastline, 300 marinas, and 12,000 boat slips, Anne Arundel County represents the most significant access to waterfront in central Maryland. So Thanks. Uh, Rick, I, a lot of the board, the, the other board feels that 12,000 is not uh, enough. <laughs> it sounds it sounds low to me, but just yeah, yeah, it sounds low to just about everybody. Rick, the other thing that sounds low is the number of people that are employed by the maritime industry in the county. Uh, you have three hundred marinas. You said there are eight thousand people employed. That that yeah, eighty seven hundred or eighty six hundred is the number. Eighty six hundred uh, is is does it qualify what it takes to be an employee? I mean to be employed in the maritime museum, uh, museum in the maritime industry, uh, there are so many things that are mechanics and things that are both maritime related and everybody that works in a particular marina would be maritime uh, and maritime related and employee. Is there a breakdown as how that is? That just seems- Yes, like there is in the, in the body okay. of the report because uh, right from the very beginning, that issue has been a tough one to address because it's very difficult to get a handle on exactly what constitutes working in the um, uh, recreational maritime industry because it doesn't fit any of the, the national categories that are used by mm -hmm. a lot of the uh, economists. Can and you repeat the, um, the revenue? Can you also repeat the, um, can you repeat the, uh... The deficits in revenue. I'm sorry. Can you repeat the deficit? The deficits in revenue. Um. Because our revenue is up almost oh. 25 percent. But Beth, I, what I said about that was that none of the COVID effects are reflected in this, and there is a disclaimer in the report that everything was studied and done before a lot of this. And you, you may be talking about the bump that came this past summer. Uh, once I might, yeah, I might have missed the details on what you said. I apologize. Yeah, but um, again, uh, the report takes some careful reading like any economic analysis does. Of course. So uh, when your, your comments regarding uh, employees in the maritime industry and, and uh, bills uh, comments also, um, there is um, 
as we're kind of it just kind of segues back to the ta task force. But one of the things that the maritime task force has focused on is the um, the importance of restaurants uh, and that and other types of those kinds of activities that are important to be on the water in marinas, et cetera, because of their attraction for the, the recreational boating population. And one, you could argue that, you know, employees of a restaurant that is located in a marina are, are as integral to the maritime uh, employment as, uh, you know, as other, as other people. Um, so- Yeah, that's, that's one of the examples that was used as um, <clears throat> how difficult it is to get a handle on uh, the actual number of people we're talking about. Uh, anybody else have any comments or questions for Rick? Uh, otherwise, we can. Uh, everybody has an opportunity to look at this before our next meeting, and we can revisit it if we wish uh, at our next meeting with in, in more detail uh, when we have more detail. Uh, Mr. Rice, that's a hard act to follow. <laughs> I thought I saw him earlier. Maybe he went to Mardi Gras. All right, we'll pass on Mr. Rice. Uh, Mr. Hood, anything, any, any, no, any news or no news on the comprehensive plan? It's crickets out here, guys. I'm starting to feel shunned. I'm going to follow <laughs> up. I'll follow up on those guys and see if I can get going on. Thanks. I know Eric Lashinsky has been uh, had his hands full with a variety of things um, uh, that all kind of begin to dovetail in, back into that, including our next topic, which is the Maritime Task Force update. Um, I don't have a real detailed update. Um, the there was a large task force meeting about two weeks ago, uh, where there was. Um, the, the goal was to establish some consensus on the path that the task force was taking, and there seemed to be consensus on that. Um, and then the there was a presentation to the uh, planning commission uh, shortly thereafter. I think on the maybe on the third or fourth of February, uh, that first Thursday, um, which I did briefly speak with Eileen and the planning commission essentially was on board with moving forward. So the next step is now to begin to get down to the hard, the hard issues, and that is um, matching up proposed, current and proposed uses um, across the various zones with the standards that would apply to those particular uses. And the devil is going to be in the details. Um, I have not gotten specific direction on how that is going to move forward, although it is the intent is to move it forward quickly and get it back to planning commission uh, and for open for public comments. Uh, but there will be a number of standards that will apply, um, also called triggers, but they're in, in the code, they're actually standards. And that's everything from what standards would apply to a restaurant, you know, outdoor dining, indoor dining, uh, live music, acoustic music, uh, electrified music, uh, hours, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so, but I think there's going, there's, it seems to be consensus on the broad categories of uses. Uh, the devil will be in the details about uh, percentages of non-maritime use and things like that. So stay tuned is about all I can say is it will come back uh, in whatever formal format that it takes, um, it should come back to uh, this board as part of whatever legislation is ultimately enacted. Um, and that's about it. And I see Mr. Rice has joined us. Mr. Rice, what do you have for us on economic development? Sorry, I, uh, I had some technical difficulty and I lost my connection. So uh, that's I'm, all right. I'm back in the saddle or on the boat. Um, so the, uh, just an update from economic development, the liquor license rules are in effect given the, uh, uh governor's recent or uh, relatively recent, uh, action. And so for, and that's for indoor dining. So with respect to restaurants, uh, whatever restaurants have in their liquor license is the determining factor for when they must close 
indoors, but if they're within the recovery zones, then, uh, and they have an outdoor dining component, then the recovery zone permit dictates the outdoor dining uh, closure. So that's uh, uh, pretty significant. And we're also at 50% capacity uh, for most businesses, retail, restaurant, and, and what have you. Our focus in economic development uh, as of late has been supporting small businesses and the, the small business community. Um, we helped the mayor host a, a small business town hall with the Small Business Development Center uh, recently. And uh, it was a Q&A kind of session that you know, followed a presentation on the uh, PPP loans and the EIDL loans, PPP uh, payroll protection program and EIDL economic injury disaster loans, both uh, small business administration programs. And we've also retained uh, retired banker Patrick Sherney from um, uh, Sandy Spring Bank. Uh, he has uh, pro been providing uh, counseling for small businesses in the city. And specifically, he has put together two workshops for small business owners. We also had those workshops uh, recorded and I believe they're available through, um, uh, through YouTube on the city website. Um, the other thing that we've been pretty active with is supporting the Maritime Task Force and helping to staff their uh, activities. And uh, the last piece is uh, the, uh, our shop local campaign, Shop Dine Stay. Uh, we kicked that off, I guess it would, would have been last month. And uh, so we've been advertising that as well. The, the theme there is that we, you know, we want uh, Annapolitans especially to support their local businesses during this period. The winter months, as you know, for a lot of businesses are pretty lean. And so um, without the, you know, everything's compounded by COVID. We don't have the tourist traffic and the day trippers that we would normally have. So we're, we're hoping that Annapolitans will step up and support their local uh, establishments, their favorite establishments. So um, that's the long and the short for me. Stephen, what is what is the um, what's the legislature doing? Is most of the, is most of their activities virtual, so they're not uh, hitting the bars and restaurants at night? Uh, yes, and a uh, big thing on the legislative front is the Governor's Relief Act or a relief program that he is. Uh, proposed and it's making its way uh, uh, through both chambers of the uh, Maryland General Assembly. I don't think it's, you know, passed or, you know, had final passage and I'm pretty sure it hasn't been signed into law yet. But uh, to answer your question, yes. I mean, they're, they're having, you know, virtual um, uh, uh, hearings and so forth and virtual meetings. And I I've, have heard that there have been some floor votes but I don't think that's the norm. Okay. Short answer is that we're not getting the, uh, the, I'll call it tourist for lack of a better word, the bump, the legislative bump, uh, but like Monday nights when they have a Monday night session and everybody comes to town and um, we're not getting that this year. Exactly. Okay. All right, uh, any, any questions for our economic development uh, update? I had a question. It's a technical question, uh, curiosity. If they're in the recovery zones and where the extra seats are put on the street or if somebody puts a tent up and it's 50% um, occupancy, if there's 50 seats in a restaurant and they can be 25 seats used and you add on another 30 seats in a, a tent or whatever outside, is that added on or do they have to use their original 50% off the basic seats inside. So yeah, they get, so they get free seats outside is my question. Sure, uh, there's a, a capacity for uh, in, indoors and then there's a separate capacity number for outdoors. Good, so they're not penalized by right. the outdoors. Excellent, thank you. But that does lead to the question of, has there been any discussion? I take it I would have seen if, if there had been a decision probably about are we how the city is going to handle um, some of these, I'll call them pop-up outdoor facilities. Once we get past COVID and we go to 100% indoor, are we gonna kick them back off the street? Or are we gonna be looking at keeping some outdoor component um, to the dining? 
Uh, it's hard to say what, uh, you know, what, what will happen, but I get the sense that, you know, the, the outdoor component uh, will, will be with us for some time. Good, because I, I mean, and Frida, you're, you know, you're closer to the, uh, to the parking in Eastport, and I'm just using Eastport as an example, but despite the fact that we have taken uh, boatyard parking out, out of the boatyard's parking lot and we've got, uh, we've taken the parking, a little bit of parking out of the forward brewing and we've shut down uh, off of Davis's, I have not experienced any particular uh, angst or issues with parking. Now, maybe that's because the restaurants still are not at 100% capacity anyway because of the 25% indoor and outdoor, et cetera. But uh, Frida, what's your sense on, for example, in Eastport, what impact it's this, the taking some parking away has had? Well, the, the bug yard took their tent down a while back and they're using their parking lot for vehicles now. Okay. And, um, Sunday being Valentine's Day, they did a robust business because I could tell starting at 11 a.m., the our street was full of cars with people okay. going to uh, Valentine's Day brunch at the butt yard in Davis's pub. Um, I we haven't really had a problem, you know. It's of course it's February and it's cold. We'll see what happens in May, you know, or June. But um, I'm I'm grateful that Davis's and the butt yard and Ford Brewing they have enough business to keep going because I would hate to see them go under um, with everything that's going on right now. Right, I mean, there are, and, and, that's, and that's, that's true with, you know, the, some of the other areas in town too. I mean, even downtown, um, it's, it's, it's just an interesting how um, the sky has not fallen, so to speak. Yeah, uh, this is Debbie. Um, if places like the, on Main Street where they're using public property, if after the state of emergency, people wanted to use outdoor dining um, and use public property, would they be required to have a lease? Um, one would think that if in fact they are going to use public property, that a lease would be um, appropriate. Um, I'm sure somebody will think of that. <laughs> Andy, would you like to be excused? <laughs> for me, I just want to know if there's going to be a charge for the impromptu concert, Andy. Do we need to send something to hear, hear that horn of yours? <laughs> I'm going to contribute to uh, the welfare of downtown. <laughs> Especially distance. All right, go contribute. Hey, hey, looking good, good Andy. Have Bye. fun. Yeah, let the good times roll. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> What, what, let the bon temp roule or something like that. Something like that. Something, something like, like that. that. All right. Um, Debbie, I haven't heard anything on the NDZ application, uh, nor have uh, it, it, I assume it's just still continuing to meander. I haven't heard anything since the last update I gave you. All right. Um, we have a, um, I, and actually, thank you very much. Uh, actually, sent around the uh, revised, um, or at least the link to the Charter Doc policy statement, which is actually part and parcel of the Charter Doc application. Um, Debbie, I, I got the impression that she had incorporated, or the city had incorporated, uh, your final comments from November, and we are sort of in the two week public comment stage at this point. Do you want to tell us any, I'll start with you, Debbie, and then I'll ask Beth too, um, any uh, issues, concerns, et cetera? No, I think it looks really good, Ashley. Thank you so much for working on it um, so hard, and Beth too. Um, I did have one question in the Charter Doc application. It refers to um, Request to dock for more than 90 total minutes will not be considered until the day of the scheduled dockage and will only be permitted if it doesn't interfere with other users in the sole discretion of the harbor master. There are occasions where we have a wedding um, on one of our vessels and 
they want to have the actual ceremony at city dock. And so in the past, we have asked for a certain amount of time added on to the loading portion of it and paid for it. Is that something we would not be able to commit to the bride and groom for in the future? And I'm sorry if I missed that in the past. Gosh, we've been over these forms so many times and I know it's going to make Ashley angry with me, but I would say we probably should change that clause, tweak it just a little bit um, because the day of is, is too late. Right. It's yeah, too late. And, uh, you know, there are lots of people that want to change the usual loading and unloading. And I'm sorry, Ash, softer. Yep. It's, it's your form. So whatever you would like to do. <laughs> Just let me know. And that's why we're having the two weeks. Um, so hopefully we can get some feedback on not only that form, but um, several of the other forms that the Harbor Master uses routinely related to moorings and general dock reservations. Um, so hopefully we'll get some feedback in the next two weeks. Um, we put the links up and then we also posted something on the main front page of the website to let people know that they went up and hopefully anyone listening tonight Feel free to share that link with anyone because um, we would like to get comments back. And then at the end of the two weeks, um, we'd like to get these in effect so that the Harbor Master can start properly using them for this coming season. So when we have our 930 meeting tomorrow, maybe we can iron out. Maybe that should sounds be. good. Okay. Debbie, I do have a question. Able, Debbie, are you able to uh, get in touch with or get your comments into Beth and Ashley for their meeting tomorrow. I know yes, you're, I will do you're that. out of yeah. town. I just don't know what time zone you're in. It's only one hour away. We're, I'm in St. John's, which is pretty nice. Okay. Um, but yes, I will get that. Thank you very much. And again, I apologize if I missed that before. Okay. I do have a question on the, um, the, the fee waiver request. Is there any a uh, particular basis for that. Uh, who would be who would be requesting a waiver of the fee? In theory, anyone can request it, but it has to go up to city council for their consideration. Um, and it, it's governed by a different section of the code. It's governed by it's chapter 6.04. I think I, I don't remember the exact section but it's use of city facilities and staff that governs that particular waiver. We're actually working on a fee waiver form as we speak that we allow people to put down a lot of information like their purpose, what type of entity there are, so that city council can get some more of that information in sort of a standardized format for when all these waivers come through. Because right now it's just sort of done sort of as a written request that goes to to the mayor's office through to city council, but it's not on any prescribed um, form at this point. So we are working on that, um, but it's mostly in the city council's discretion. I think that section of the code does have some factors they can consider, um, but I have to look at it again closely, but anyone can apply for it. And then it's in the, the discretion of city council. $300. Yeah, but I would assume that sort of thing would come primarily from nonprofits. I'll defer to Beth. I don't actually see most of them. I mean, it it, do, it doesn't say that. And uh, no, no, I know it doesn't say that. That was a, that was a question about the reality. What really happens? Who requests fees waivers this way? Is so what what really happens is it's mostly nonprofits, but we have had some that are not nonprofits or not for profits, and I'm not entirely sure I understand the difference between the two. Uh, and the American do up to three hundred dollars. And I think that if you're not a nonprofit or not per, not for profit, um, it would be more likely the mayor would give you that three hundred dollar waiver. Um, so we can talk about the differences as we create the form. Okay, thank you. I have a question. This is Peter. I know the. Uh, I believe the city has a lease with the boat shows in the spring and in the fall with those dates uh, in the lease, does it make any sense at all to, uh, to in, that, in that 
request with the charter doc to, to say that those those dates aren't available? Um, we could, but the date under those leases, they actually have the option to extend or adjust them up to within a certain number of days. So it's hard to put that out too far in advance because there is some flexibility for the boat shows. Okay. So, so but I, I do think we try to put it, it out happens. there. Yeah, we do, I think, try to put it out there informally that that's when it's coming and announced, but there is some flexibility in the lease documents about moving dates around a little bit. Okay. Thank you. All right, anybody else? Uh, Ashley, while I have you, anything uh, update on the Burtis house? No, I keep prodding on um, all the field work is done on the, the surveying, um, but they're still writing everything up and drawing everything up. So we haven't gotten that yet. So we're still in that stage. All right. And um, Beth, anything more on other than Hawkins Cove, which we already heard about uh, on street end uh, park upgrades and updates? I mean, I can give the group uh, an overview. There's a, essentially seven projects and it's a lot. It's kind of a lot to speak about. So Tucker Street um, would like to have a new ramp and there's money set aside for that project and that's not grant funded. So they would like a 12 foot wide down to a four foot mean water uh, ramp. Uh, gosh, I'm trying to remember all of it with a, a floating dock. And that's, that's all been uh, preliminarily approved. Um, so Tucker Street is one project. And then um, we're working hard. We finished Lafayette. We're working hard on La uh, Cheston. So Cheston's gonna get an entire new bulkhead rain garden um, floating dock. And that should be all grant funded. Sixth Street is a little bit of a crapshoot because uh, the architecture and engineering is funded, but we're not sure if the dredging will be approved. So we're working on Sixth Street as well, but we're not entirely sure what that's going to pan out to look like. But we're hoping for a floating dock there and a dredge and an improvement to the street end park. And then we're also working on Thompson Street to demolish we're, we're hoping to demolish the, it looks like like a hairy homeowner pier there that's a little bit dangerous. So we're hoping to demolish that and put in a really nice floating pier there. And then also we're hoping to do a floating dock at Conduit, a floating dock at Amos Garrett, <clears throat> a floating dock at Third Street on Spa Creek side. Uh, so I said, so let's, let me go over this. So we said, Thompson. Third Street, Amos Garrett, Sixth Street. I'm trying to make sure I covered everything. Tucker, that's four. Uh, cover. Did I say? Did I say? Justin Amos? is five. So Amos Garrett, Thompson, Thompson. Conduit, Third Street, Tucker. Mm. I'm having a hard total. time remembering all of them. I We're trying to get together some okay. signs that go on the um, street ends, but it's a there is a ton of work with that we're doing. It's a lot of work, and uh, so what so what I did was I applied for a grant for to get started on four streets at street ends at one time, and then I applied for another. So so now instead of giving you not nine hundred ninety nine thousand dollars, now they give you two hundred fifty thousand dollars. So I've asked for two $250,000 grants to work on this. So I think we will do, I don't think we'll do all of it. I think we'll do most of it. I think we'll do 75% of it because something will happen. Something will be not approved for dredging or something will be like, oh, we're not sure it's city property. 
So, but we're going to move forward and try to get all of it done. And it's, it's seven projects and I'm trying to remember the, all of them. So you mentioned Tucker Street. Is that actually, we have before us tonight, 0521, uh, which appears to, uh, at first blush, uh, significantly restrict or limit the access to Tucker Street by requiring a permit limited to city residents, et cetera. And my first question is, is this something that has been run by the Harbor Master's office? So I should probably like Ashley speak to it first, but this is really actually no change whatsoever. It's just the only change is really making it enforceable. Um, Cause Tucker street has always been only for Annapolis city residents and it, it has like not been in a great spot. So I'll let Ashley speak to it. All right. So um, the two main purposes, one was to pull it out of title 11 of the code, which is in theory enforced by the police department. And it was kind of a weird spot for this to be. So we moved it to title 15. And then the second piece, as Beth said, um, was just to make it enforceable. So the original code section has always been limited to city residents, but it never indicated how that was actually going to be enforced with, you know, within staff and monetary confines. So we decided to do similar to what we do with um, parking permits, which, you know, are city, city resident specific and or um, just some of the other um, permits that we do for other Harbor Master facilities. So um, we set out a process by which someone could prove that they're a city resident and they could do it in advance at the Harbor Master's office versus having to do it every time they use the facility necessarily. Um, there is a provision for a fee if needed, um, but that is really up to city council. Um, they don't have to adopt a fee related to it. And um, we'll see what city council does with it. I think it's only, it's in committee now. So it's only been on first reader. Um, but the goal was really to put it under the Harbor master instead of the police and to give the Harbor master a way to actually enforce it just being for city residents, which is what the code has said all along. So um, that's what we tried to do. So I mean, here's my question. So Tucker street is the closest public access to West Annapolis, to Growl's Market, uh, to the, you know, the grocery store there, the liquor store there. And it is used by boaters who come into uh, to Weems Creek, uh, who come ashore, uh, put somebody ashore, uh, go to the grocery store. And this would appear to, to, to eliminate that. And I can see residents who have been always, you know, there's always been a tension about residents and people parking on Tucker Street, et cetera. I mean, saying, in truth, oh, it doesn't no, change anything you whatsoever. Can't land your boat there. T Title 11 have, has always said it's only for city residents. So this isn't changing the intent of the law whatsoever, it's only changing the enforceability. Well, so, but, that, but, that, but what comes with that is people insisting on enforcement. And my question is, is and I, for this board, is whether or not that, oh, that underlying policy that says only a city resident can come ashore at that and walk up to the grocery store, I think that's a significant impact on the broader maritime industry. And does I have- Does it say a, that? Does it say only a city resident may come ashore or does it say only a city resident- well, It's, a, it's all in the question of what is defined as launch. If you come ashore, you are you then launching when you try to go back to your boat? This I that's would say the part you're not that needs launching. to be cleared up. Launching, I would say you're not launching. Well, I, it, again, it's it's this is why I raised the question, and I'll let defer to the rest of the board on that. But I I don't have a problem with the enforcement issue so long as it's not affecting visiting voters who use that ramp or that street end in order to come and get groceries and other and things. I think it's a very good question. I think your question is is a very good question. And maybe we need to look hard at definitions. 
but I certainly never considered a launcher to be a person that would come ashore. Okay, well, I'm, I'm just looking at the breadth of the how the language is written uh, and it ought to be, frankly, in my mind, it ought to be made more clear that that does not prohibit someone who is going to come ashore uh, from a, a visiting yacht. Um, I, I understand the issue of, you know, going down and launching your dinghy or whatever down there, but um, I can see people come who want to go use the grocery store and things like that, coming to a floating dock and tying up and then having a ticket given to them is not very receptive of in the city. So I'll, we'll, I'm, we're going to take that up in a few minutes, but I was just trying to get a feel since you, you, you're talking about major improvements there is that what, how that relates to this particular ordinance, that's all. Um, okay, anything else on the street end park status? I have, I have a question um, on Third Street, Beth. I understand that that Harbor Master and your, your funds that you're getting are for the waterside activities. Third Street is a little bit unique, a little bit like the end of um, near Davis's pub, that little park across the street. The city seems to maintain it and inside the bulkhead on the city side, land side, the, the street there is under, underwater about half the time, but I've, I've gone down on business down there a lot and you can't access walking along there, park the cars in the last parking space. Will the city help um, maybe raise the end of the street a little bit? Has that been looked at at all? That would probably be a question for public works. Our grants are quite minimal. Yours is water side. I can understand that. This shouldn't be so for $250,000 to do four street ends, even if it's a uh, half million dollars for four street ends. Um, you know, the engineers would have to weigh in on that and I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to speak to that. Right. Uh, Terry, should we, Maybe put that on a list, send a, send a note to Public Works because it does affect the uh, access there. And I don't think it should be in Beth's budget to have to take it out of her budget because it's, it's land side, so to speak. The land needs to get raised a foot or two and it could be done fairly easily with the street end with paving and re relocating the access to the driveways and parking lots there. It just seems like that should be a, a land oriented fix. So you're talking about what I think the general, the general term is nuisance flooding sort of makes that an unusable street end unless it's been, going to be raised up. Almost. You know, three out of seven days, it's there's water, maybe four out of seven there's on water. And then the days that it's dry, it's, it's a bunch of muck and driftwood and everything else at the end of the street. Yeah. So it's, you can hardly walk on it with walking through junk and mud. All right. I just made a note to reach okay. out to uh, Public Works. Um, who's the, who is the director of Public Works these days? Uh, somebody know? Who is who? Who's the director of Public Works now? It's Michael Johnson. Okay, thank you. All right, we have two ordinances. And since I already started the discussion about Tucker Street, um, everybody, my, my concern with Tucker Street is that it not inhibit, uh, that the ordinance not inhibit the uh, visiting voter from using Tucker Street uh, as a point of ingress and egress to get into West Annapolis and uh, amenities that are in West Annapolis. I, I appreciate the, the not launching your dinghy from there uh, if you're not a city resident without a permit, but um, that's my concern on ordinance 0521. And I'll just go around. Peter, have you had a chance to look at it? And if so, any thoughts? Uh, thank you. No, you know, I haven't taken a close look, so I don't have any comments. Okay. Rick? Um, I think that somehow or other the issue of access to cruisers needs to be addressed. Other than that, um, I don't have a problem with it. Uh, Frida. Where is this in the legislative process? Is it in a committee right now or is it being ready to be voted on by the city council? What, what stage is it at, Terry? It was just introduced a week ago, oh, actually last Monday. Um, and, um, and 
I had asked the sponsor, Alderman Tierney and Alderman Payone to refer it to the MAB and we would look at it anyway. Likewise, um, with 0321, so it's, they've been referred to committee, it's environmental matters, public safety, transportation. Uh, so it's just in the early stages, it just was introduced. And it's the same thing with 0321 or yeah, 0321. So, um, but I, I have made a note about the, the cruising access uh, and uh, Frida, do you have any other comments at this point? No, I'd, I'd just like to educate myself a little more about them before forming an opinion, but, um, but it's something, especially the Tucker Street one, I would be interested in, in learning a lot more about it. Thank you. Okay, Scott? I, I follow Frida. Um, I think it's a great idea. I think that if the uh, visiting boaters have access to it, I think there'll have to be some engineering or definition of the launching area, because when you launch, you need a portion of the pier to tie your boat up to while you're getting in and taking the trailer up and then going out versus the visitors tying up. So you don't have, have a fist fight on the dock of who's going to use the dock first and when. So there would need to be, you know, careful consideration, I think, to earmarking an area for the launchers that launch the boat because they have to tie the boat up until they park the car and for the visitors so that they don't encroach on each other. Maybe the pier has to be made long enough that both can happen without somebody duking it out. I don't, I don't really think it would be different than any other launch. So, um, so. given that it's only open to Annapolis city residents for launching and given that we only get a handful of boaters that use that. And maybe it's a moot point, but I just. And, and given that nice we're place. also going to install um, a really nice floating dock for people to wait. <clears throat> I, um, given, you know, my experience on the water, I'm, sh I'm certain that people can be respectful in the same way that they're respectful on the roadway. You know, there might be someone that screams and says, Hey, you need to hurry up and launch your boat. But in general, there will be a nice floating dock that you can tie up to while someone's launching and wait for them to finish before you try to retrieve your boat. Cause yeah, it's I, I, I need to take a look at it. I just existing facility. Does the floating dock stick out past the end of the bulkhead or whatever that they, some boats the yeah, dinghies nice can tie on both sides? That comes out. Uh, there'd be a nice floating dock that comes out that doesn't exist now. Um, I can't remember the exact dimensions. Is there a is there a, uh, an engineering drawing uh, planned to you or something of what's what's proposed for that? There is um, what do they call that a PIF, which is a project initiation form, which I have filled out um, based on the community's request and in concert, in perfect uh, harmony with what the community wants. Uh, so I have filled that out and I can present it if anyone wants it. That would, if you could send that, that I think would give everybody a, a better physical view of, uh, or at least a conceptual view of what's, uh, what's planned there and how it would interrelate with this with this ordinance. Okay. Uh, Duncan? Yeah, from what I've read and what I've heard, I have no problems with this at all. Okay, and Bill? I'm not familiar with the site at Tucker Street, so I, I don't think that my comments would uh, uh, be justified or, or necessary. Oh, people comment about things they don't know anything about all the time. <laughs> well, I don't, eh, you know. In <laughs> fact, I, I just <laughs> pulled it up on Google Maps and I was over in that area today <laughs> visiting a friend. And uh, I said, oh, that's where it is. I should have shot down there to take a look <laughs> at it. So I will, you know, now yeah. ask me next meeting and I'll tell you all about it. What it, I, what it's I a thought, great spot, okay? though. It really is. It's a, it it's a, like it. it's a, it's yeah. a, it's a little, it's a little secret in Annapolis secret. that yep. a lot I'm of people don't that. don't know about that we actually have two boat ramps in Annapolis. But, but I will say it's a long walk from there to Grouse. If you got a, if you got a boat moored out there, and you need to pick up something from Grouse, uh, 
You better take your little, I don't know, your moped or whatever you got on, yeah. on your dinghy to get over the grounds the from in, there. That, that, the, that's incentive, cool. the incentive is for the walk is the liquor store next to grounds. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. Um, I've, I've made some notes here about uh, that one. 0321. Um, I don't, uh, Ross is not on the call this evening. This was Alderman Gay and Alderman Arnett's bill. I did talk to Ross because I, at first I was a little bit concerned about um, what, the, what it was trying to do. Uh, and what I have learned is that the gist of this is that the port wardens have not been taking into account pub the effect on public access when they can uh, when they are considering uh, uh, granting permits, for example, for uh, either a, a dock uh, expansion or a lift um, to be installed. <clears throat> and what he is, uh, has told me that he's talking about, and I will just use it as an example. Uh, if you go to the, um, the dock at the end of 4th Street at Davison, that little park there, there is a city dock. There's a, there's a little dock that sticks out from that. And if you're standing on the shore on the right-hand side, the port wardens approved a boat lift that um, makes it a little bit tricky for the public to come in and access that dock. And they did not take into account, apparently, public access uh, as a factor in determining whether or not to grant the permit. And there are other areas where you've got a tight, narrow um, approach to a street end, um, on, particularly on, uh, on, in, on the Eastport Peninsula and on, along Spa Creek, I think Third Street's fairly tight, uh, certainly Burnside Street's fairly tight. And I am told by Ross that the uh, purpose of this is to involve, is to require the port wardens to take the public access from public property into account, either, either from public property or from a, an easement. Uh, there are some, there's a couple of areas where there is actually an easement for public access. It's not, it's not city property but it was part of the development scheme. I think it's in Wells Cove maybe, um, that in order, before you can allow, uh, the port, before the port wardens can allow development of a erection of a, uh, any, a structure or construction of structures or other barriers within the developable waterway, um, they have to take, they have to make a specific finding with respect to effect on public access. So, um, it is less, uh, it became once with that explanation, it became less of a concern to me uh, than what I first read it as is that any private citizen who wanted to put a docket there uh, out their bulkhead uh, would have to make provision for public access across their property, um, which it, it turns out that is not the case with this ordinance. Um, it is only limited to um, the that it would not interfere with the navigation between the shoreline of any public property or easement area established for the benefit of the public. So that's its um, that's the genesis. Actually, do you have anything to add? My misstating what I think now is what I understand now to be the purpose. I honestly have not read this legislation in full yet. I, I'm assigned to several others. I'll take a look at it. That sounds plausible for what Ross, for Alderman um, Arnett and Alderman Gay would be trying to do, but I've only briefly looked at it. Um, if you would just take a look at that and let me know if my interpretation is incorrect. I, my concern is that um, is that it not be t telling the port wardens to provide public access or to take public access across private property into consideration. But if they're only talking about taking into consideration, interfering or obstructing access to public uh, access points, um, I'm far less concerned about it. 
Of course, I'll take a look at it either tonight or tomorrow morning and let you know. Okay, no, do, do not take a look at it tonight. It's morning. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I would not, will not task with that. Um, all right. Terry, yeah. can I ask a question? It's Debbie. Yeah. Um, why do lateral lines not control the situation? I, I think they would. And I asked Ross that. The problem is, is that the port wardens somehow seems to think that uh, that they don't have to take public inter obstruction of public access into their thought process. But if you have riparian rights from lateral line to lateral line and out to the harbor line, um, as long as you stay within those, how can the public access be impacted? Well, I think part of the problem is, is that they are certain of the approvals do not stay within necessarily within that, or they come out to the five feet uh, with the encroaching the five feet. Huh. Yeah. Well, it's going to create fights, I would imagine. Well, it might. Uh, and that's why I'm trying to understand what it's, what, what it's, I mean, I'm, I'm reading this only, I only read this three days ago. Uh, I had a conversation with Ross about it and then, um, uh, and got that explanation. I, it, I, I, I look forward to what Ashley's take on this is. Yeah. Um, my concern was getting into the private property realm, but it also, uh, I got the impression it was strictly to clarify for the port wardens that they have to take these things into consideration when they believe they don't ha didn't have to, so. Yeah, the um, additional language in C of section 1516030 could really be open to interpretation um, with what you're talking about. Because it just says what, that- the, what, Yeah, that's what exactly yeah. caught me. Access by the public for public recreational purposes. Right, that's very, that could be interpreted in many different ways. Yeah, and I just don't want words. Don't don't want the city telling the port wardens that they have to allow public access across public private property. <laughs> right. Or even consider it. Or even okay, thank it you. Into consideration. But Ashley is going to take a look at that and I, I, I'll wait and see what the take is on that and then we can comment thereafter. Thanks. All right. That is the last thing on the agenda. Um, so I will simply go around. Peter, anything else? Uh, Terry, thanks for asking. No, I'm fine. Thank you. Rick, anything else? Nope. It's uh, time to go celebrate Mardi Gras. Just about. Frida? Nothing. Thank you. Duncan? I'm fine. Thank you very much. Happy Fat Tuesday. A Fat Tuesday, right. Isn't it used to be called Pancake Tuesday or something? Well, now it's just putting on weight. <laughs> Mr. Woodward, anything else? Uh, I just want to know if anybody knows where Andy went. Uh, I'd like to go down there maybe, but no, I'm fine. Thank he you. Went, he went to out on the street in front of Red Red Wine Bar on Main Street, I think. Oh, okay. Sounds, sounds, sounds cold good. to me. Scott? <laughs> I'm good. Thank you very much. Debbie? Nope, nothing else. Thank you. And since you're the last one to speak, I heard a motion to adjourn. Yes, I you moved. A second for me on that one. <laughs> and Mr. Hood is good. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Tammy, Ashley, Beth, Stephen, thank you very much. Have a good evening. Happy Mardi Gras.